Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Today's show is brought to you by OnPay, the new standard in payroll. You can pay employees and contractors in minutes, automate your payroll taxes and filings, as well as provide health benefits and HR in all 50 states. For more information, visit buildingthefutureshow.com slash onpay. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Mike Alfred. He's the co-founder and CEO at Digital Assets Data. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing is actually really innovative and cool. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. Yeah, so I was born and raised in in San Diego, California, in a little town called Del Mar, just north of La Jolla, about 25 minutes or so from downtown. Uh, Grew up surfing, grew up playing soccer. I uh, was a smart kid in school. I I got chastised by my uh, kindergarten uh, math teacher for finishing the math book uh, for the entire year in the first day. Um, <laughs> that was I, I realized that I was an overachiever um, at that point. And I you know did well in school, played a lot of sports, mostly stayed out of trouble. Not but, although not fully. I'm kind of a troublemaker uh, at heart. Um, got into Stanford, studied history. Uh, started trading stocks and learning about the markets when I was in college, and so it was no surprise I kind of went into the financial services world when I graduated. Sure. So, what made you take history? You know, I I've always been a prolific reader. I, I mean, in grade school, I once read a book uh, called "Eye of the World" by Robert Jordan. It's like 1,100 pages. Wow. I read it in eight hours in one sitting without leaving my room, <laughs> um, and then I came out to have something to eat, um, and so I. I I was always able to process large volumes of information quickly. And my best teachers in high school, uh, Mrs. Davis, who was my AP European history teacher, they were all history teachers. And I learned really quickly that synthesizing large volumes of information was one of my skill sets. And I think as a historian, that's essentially what you're doing. You're you're taking lots of information, you're distilling it down into key points, um, and then being able to communicate those clearly to someone else. And I had an interesting lunch uh, with another Stanford history major, a guy named Chris Kramer, who's the CEO of Carl Strauss Brewing, which was one of the first big craft brewers in Southern California. And the first time we had lunch together, this is 15 years ago, he said, Mike, you know, you'll, you'd be surprised how many business leaders studied history um, and how useful it is for business. And I've actually found that to be true. Interesting. No, that, that's that's fascinating. So you get out of school, walk us through your journey um, co-founding Brightscope, getting it acquired, and then let's continue on your journey up until digital assets data. Sure. So so my brother and I were retail financial advisors. So this is like calling grandmas on the phone and saying, hey, can we come by and review you know, your insurance and investments and build a financial plan for you? Um, and so it was pretty, it was, it was grunt work essentially, but I learned how the retail financial services world worked. Um, you know, sold insurance, investments, built financial plans. Um, and as I was doing that, we recognized that there was a gap in terms of data, right? So Morningstar had all this data on mutual funds and stocks, and you could build portfolio models real easily for clients. But when it came to their 401k plan, there was no visibility, right? Like if you went online in 2007 or 2008 and said, how good is my Hewlett Packard 401k plan? How good is my Amgen plan? That was only 12 years ago. And at that time, there was literally a black hole on the internet. And so we said, let's fill that. So we flew to Washington, D.C. in 2008. We, we had just raised a million bucks on a deck, right? That's a whole other story, like raising money the first time for like a software or data business when you're just a retail financial advisor. But we made that leap, right? We, we worked really hard to figure out how to, 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 to jump that gap. And when we showed up in Washington, D.C., we had raised enough money that we weren't willing to go home. So even though the guy in the disclosure room at the Department of Labor said, hey, like we don't have the data you're looking for. We just wouldn't leave. And eventually, <laughs> looking over his shoulder 
on his laptop, we discovered the data we were looking for, which was the audited financial statement for every 401k plan above, I think it's uh, 100 uh, people or 500 people, forgetting the exact totals. But essentially every large 401k plan in America was filing this document with the government, but the government had never released it to the public, even though it was technically supposed to be public. So we filed 50 or 75 Freedom of Information Act requests. We manually gathered that data and we built up a model of like what every 401k plan in America essentially looked like. So we had a list of all the funds in Google's 401k plan and how much money the employees had put in each one. We knew who the provider was. We were able to build a model of how good those investments were, how good those fees were. And we created a zero to 100 score that, that basically would tell you how good each 401k plan was compared to any other. And that by itself was kind of a marketing breakthrough, right? It, it, there was no money necessarily in creating those ratings. But by putting those ratings out there, we got the attention of the industry. So Fidelity and T. Rowe Price and Vanguard and J.P. Morgan, all these companies started to become interested in the data we were gathering. And we went from public data to getting these larger companies to share their private data with us. And then eventually we built a data consortium sitting on top of it in a give to get model where a lot of those companies were sharing data into a centralized uh, database that essentially we manage. And then we would... Uh, process that information and send back the analytics to each company. That ended up being the key to getting the business to scale and to getting the product to be really sticky. It's when we sold the business in 2016, it was doing just over 10 million in revenue. Wow. It's very sticky business, um, about 29 or 30 large asset manager clients. I just checked in with some of our folks that are still with the business uh, three plus years later. Um, and the business now has 45 customers and it's closer to 15 million in revenues had virtually zero churn wow. uh, since we sold it. So it's, it was a very good, well-constructed business. Obviously I wish it was 150 or 1.5 billion in revenue company, but that just wasn't the nature of that channel. There's really only 50 large asset managers or financial institutions that matter in the U S and we effectively built the, the industry leading product that they all use now. That's very cool. So you, sell the company walk us through that did you take some time off did you have to go work there for a while walk us through that journey so it's actually an interesting i'll just give you the quick version but sure. we actually went out to try to buy another company okay uh, because we we were at 10 million in revenue and we really wanted to be 50 or 100 and we saw some adjacent verticals where we thought we could make a difference and so i sniffed out uh, a company that was about to go to auction had 40 million in revenue and 15 in EBITDA. And I had built a lot of good relationships with private equity firms that focused on FinTech. And I was able to get two out of the five we pitched to put a bid in with us. We actually bid 170 million for this business that was 40 million in revs and 15 in EBITDA. The, the, the industrial logic for the transaction would have been that we had built an over-engineered organization. We had 40 engineers. We we're running everything in the cloud. It was a super slick technology stack. And this company that had 40 million in revenue was really valuable data, but no tech. And it's essentially been hollowed out uh, over time by private equity and, and ownership by larger corporates. So we bid on the business. We ended up uh, not being willing. We weren't willing to pay the 200 million that we needed to go through to the next round. What ended up happening is the guys that ended up buying it, I approached them directly and said, look, here are the problems as we see it. And here's why we think you're overpaying. Uh, if you buy us too, we can fix the problems for you. That's so we ended up engineering our own transaction by going on the offensive side and actually trying to buy a larger company. Um, and so, you know, we sold in 2016. Uh, I spent about 15 months working on the integration of that other business that was 40 million revenue, our business, and then the larger business. That business, Strategic Insight, had about 120 million in revenue. And then it was later sold last year to Institutional Shareholder Services, ISS, which is a significantly larger uh, company that's well known in financial services circles. And so, you know, it was a tough period, right? Because if you're a CEO, you really only do three things, right? You raise money, manage the cap table, right? So all the financial components, right. um, you hire the world's best people and keep them kind of motivated. And then you set strategy and you align all those things together. Um, when you are a CEO gets acquired by another CEO, and you continue to try to do your CEO job, you end up running into that other CEO and everything you do. So I tried that for 15 months. They paid us a lot of money, right? We didn't do, we did everything we could to sit, to kind of bring those businesses together. But at the end of the day, there weren't, there wasn't much for me to do. And so my brother Ryan actually left first about three months before me, started a crypto hedge fund that today has about 60 or $70 million of assets under management. Wow. And he realized really quickly 
that there was no institutional grade data platforms for the crypto asset industry. And there were all these new hedge funds being built by really smart young people to, to sell and to, to buy and to trade, you know, and to hold all of these different new protocols, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and things that go beyond that. And he said, look, there's an opportunity here to build a Bloomberg or a FactSet or a Morningstar, you know, for this new uh, nascent asset class. I said, that's really, really interesting. And so it didn't take me long to, to realize that that was a much bigger opportunity than staying, uh, you know, in place where I was. And so I jumped out in January of 2018. We quickly raised, you know, $3 million right out of the gate in a seed round. Obviously, it helps if you've had success and you've had success building software companies and raising money and then having a full exit. It's much easier to raise for your second company. You may have less energy <laughs> and less enthusiasm, um, but you have more experience. And I think, you know, experience and wisdom trumps, you know, youthful exuberance pretty much every time. Interesting. Why do you say that? Uh, I, th I think like if I was going to statistically rate every entrepreneur, right, by the odds of getting to a successful exit, I would say, yeah, the, like some of the biggest outcomes come from 19 and 22 and 24 year old entrepreneurs that really know nothing when they start. But if you look at the average or median outcome, I think you're much more likely to get a two, three, five, ten x return from a seed round from somebody who knows exactly what to do as long as they choose the right market, right? I think I think there's a little bit of luck in what market you end up in, but I think a lot of what throws people off um, at first time entrepreneurs and why a lot more companies fail than should is they literally they're they're doing things. I see this all the time with the younger entrepreneurs that I mentor. They're doing things that that actually don't matter or they're not prioritizing correctly. And I think once you've spent 10 or 15 years building software companies, it doesn't mean that you always know the right thing to do, but you're just much more likely to get most of the decisions right uh, and sequentially. And I think that can make a big difference in the outcome. No, I 100% agree with you. I'm curious, you mentioned something there that uh, you've found meant when mentoring people that they do stuff that doesn't matter. Do you maybe want to give us a few examples of that? Because I'm kind of fascinated. Yeah, so so my view is like, you know, when you're building a software company and you're a founder and you're in the first two to say 30 or 40 employees, you really just need to build the product efficiently and and get customers right and continue to fund the enterprise through that period while adding great people right and that's it and what i see a lot of ceos doing is uh taking a long time to make a decision about who to use as their outside accounting firm right or taking a lot of time to use on a decision about whether to use silicon valley bank or some other bank or a whole bunch of other micro decisions that ultimately don't actually weight very highly in whether or not they build a billion dollar company or fail um, whereas th there are a few things that really require, you know, a lot of attention, right? Like, like exactly what does the product do? How are you going to go to market? Right. Um, I see a lot of CEOs who spend less than 10 or 15% of their time on fundraising when in reality, uh, every single company that dies, dies because they run out of money. Right. So knowing that if you wanted to mitigate that risk, um, it's okay to go up to 50 or 60 or maybe even 70% of your time on fundraising for a time limited period, uh, as long as you get the result that you're looking for. And so I'll see CEOs sitting in an engineering meeting for three hours to make one decision and not taking calls from investors that are interested in writing them, you know, a hundred K seed check. And I think that's a mistake. That's actually really good advice. So what exactly does digital assets data do? So we built a, a platform, and I say platform intentionally here um, because what it does is it allows the customer to access basically hundreds of terabytes now of relevant crypto related data uh, in any format or any method that they want to, right? So we didn't just build a lightweight GUI and say, hey, here, here, you can download this or you can access this um, and you can use the preconceived charts. We wanted to give the user access to literally build any model, uh, write any quantitative investment strategy, monitor any dimension of the market they want in any sort of customized way they want, whether they use it in our platform or via APIs or on their own platform. And so we, we actually um, started with an embedded development environment. It's, it's leveraging you know, a, a platform called Jupyter, 
that a lot of data scientists use. And so you can actually write code in Python directly into the digital assets data platform, pulling in using our domain specific language, which basically makes calling the any crypto data uh, very easy. You can write plain text things like BTC dot price, you know, dash uh, exchange Coinbase, right? And pull down a price series into a data frame that allows you to start manipulating it. And so we literally have customers across the spectrum building very advanced machine learning models, building quantitative investing strategies that then plug in right into an order execution environment. We have people that are monitoring different components of the market. Like let's say you made an early investment in a certain DeFi protocol and you really want to monitor adoption from a bunch of different angles over time. You can build those uh, views directly into our platform. And then we've also built a robust set of APIs, you know, so that you can pull down any data you want across market data, which is basically spot and derivatives, right, across the entire market. Um, On-chain data, which is all the data coming off of these blockchains directly, and then a whole bunch of reference data sets. And so we, we made a strategic decision to give the customer sort of infinite flexibility as opposed to a single way to use the data. And so far that's that's working. It's a, it's a much heavier duty platform to try to build from scratch, but if you can actually build it, um, what you find is you can serve a lot of different types of customers at the same time, which is absolutely essential in a, in a nascent market like crypto where there really aren't that many players globally who can afford to spend 50 or $100,000 a year for a data platform. No, that, that's interesting. So I'm curious, just to step back for a second. So how do you guys, or I, I guess when your clients are using your platform, how is it similar or different to the current platforms that they're using for the non kind of digital asset classes? So, uh, you know, when you think about, when you think about Bloomberg, right? Yeah. Uh, Bloomberg terminal, it's got pretty comprehensive data for like Microsoft, right? There's 20 screens and it's got all the fundamental metrics. You got all the charts, you got all the ownership information and you could download that information to Excel if you want, but most people just look at it right in the terminal. Right. And it updates mm -hmm. over time. Like that's a pretty simple use case. If you're a trader and you want, you know, you want to look up some basic information on Microsoft. What's different about crypto is it's a much more technologically native asset class. The asset itself was created via technology, right? It's not a, it's not like Microsoft where it is a, you could actually get a paper stock certificate. Most people don't have one, but you could transact using a paper stock certificate and a napkin in a pub if you wanted to, right? You can't yeah. do that really with Bitcoin because it ultimately reconciles to a blockchain, which has a universal historical record of every transaction that happened. So if, so if you had the same transaction record for Microsoft of every trade that ever happened, um, and you knew sort of from a entity standpoint who those organizations were that were trading it, that would be a data set that would probably be too big to, to be used on a simple static screen on a Bloomberg terminal. So that's just one example of where what we tried to do was was not look backwards and build the historical analogy going forward, but look forward and say, what are the unique characteristics of crypto that would necessitate the building of a literally brand new paradigm for a financial data platform in the future, which is enabling data scientists and quant investors and basically the investor of the future to do the things they want to do with data that you literally can't do in a more static platform like a Bloomberg terminal. So I think Bloomberg will continue to be relevant potentially for decades, but I think it'll become less relevant in a world where quants are building custom data warehouses and, and analytics platforms, leveraging all kinds of alternative data and data sets like crypto that are so much bigger um, and so much more, they go, go into different dimensions that are not kind of well suited for the traditional structure. Interesting. No, I, I that's fascinating actually. So for people that think Crypto's maybe just a fad or it's not really going to be around. I know like if you read online, sometimes it seems like Bitcoin is tanking and everything's, it's not really a thing. And I think it's actually the, it's basically going to be the currency of the future. Sure. Bitcoin or Ethereum or a bunch of them may or may not be around. Who knows? But what are you, what are your thoughts around the actual security and reliability and 
the lifespan of this cryptocurrency or these cryptocurrencies? Well, I don't even think of them as cryptocurrencies per se, uh, not all of them, right? Because you've got these crypto assets like Bitcoin that look more like a digital store of value, right? Okay. Like a long-term replacement to fiat currency, which given the current you know, modern monetary theory blitzkrieg that's going on yeah. over the last few weeks, makes it even more clear that a scarce, uh, verifiably scarce digital uh, asset um, as a store of value could be incredibly valuable. Then you have a whole bunch of utility tokens that are used to provision a service. And then you have a whole bunch of security tokens, which are just digital representations of real world assets like stocks and real estate and bonds and derivatives. What I think is going to happen is that it's not going to be an either or type of thing. It's you're actually going to see digital assets just subsume large portions of the traditional financial market, because why would you only trade a stock or only be able to trade stocks in the U S for seven and a half hours a day um, if you also wanted to trade, say, European stocks denominated in euros, or you wanted to trade Japanese stocks traded in yen, or maybe you wanted to trade them on a Saturday or a Sunday, like there's no reason why you can't do that as long as you create the right structure. So you can imagine a, a wrapped security token ADR. It's, it's a digital asset. It's a European traded entity, but it trades on a 24-7 cycle across Asia and the U.S. seven days a week, which allows capital markets to open up. So so is it fair that certain people in China can't buy Alibaba stock? In my view, no. It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? There's plenty of Chinese investors who would love to to have ownership directly of some of America's or even some of China's best com companies that are listed in the U.S. So I think about this a little bit more broadly. I think people were taken uh, away on a little bit of a ride by the 2017 mania and thinking about these like magical internet money tokens that would go up and down in value. But the underlying like technology stack here enables the next generation of capital markets in a way that I think is going to essentially eat um, traditional markets. And, and one example from like the late nineties that always comes back to me um, that I think could tell you kind of where this could go is something as simple as real time quotes. I remember I was trading stocks in my Stanford dorm room in the late nineties and all stock quotes were delayed 15 minutes or 20 minutes on most platforms. Okay. And you had to like pay or subscribe to get real time information. And the thought then was, well, not, not that many people are going to do that because who needs to know where stock trades more than every 15 minutes. Right. And, and by the way, it was 29.99 to, to trade a stock on E-Trade at the time. So I was trading stocks with 15 minute delayed quotes in the late nineties and paying 29.99. And then a, a free, uh, a real-time quote service came out called free real-time. And then all of a sudden, if you just registered, you could see the quote immediately. It was like mind blowing to people that, that you didn't have to wait 15 minutes after the, the market price to get the quote. And my point in all this is just that like a lot of people think that something that's newer technology or whatever is just a, like a gimmick. It's just a nice to have, but essentially what happens in all these markets is whatever is possible ends up very quickly becoming table stakes. And so I think, now that we know that assets can trade 24 seven and globally, and that anyone should be able to access them in a democratized way, that it's an invariable inevitable um, that, that going forward, you look at a decade that'll happen in all markets. And I think that is the power of crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, you know, the blockchain DLT, like that's really where we're going. And I don't lose, I don't spend a lot of time trying to guess like is Ethereum or 15 of these other smart contract platforms are going to be the winner. I'm looking out more like a decade and saying that this is going to this is going to be the capital markets stack. Right. No, that that makes a lot of sense. Like the the thing that's fascinating to me about it is how these assets are basically getting rid of the borders, right? To your point, it I can buy potentially anything worldwide and so can you and so can anybody else on the planet. And and it's so weird to me that we're still so broken up by these like made up geographical borders. I get they're like countries and it's more complicated than that. But like the fact that this whole space is just like leveling the playing field and it's almost kind of like the internet, right? It's like anybody on the planet can have access to the internet and, and this digital asset class is doing the, the same thing, but with kind of 
these traditional archaic systems. Do you know what I'm? Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I would agree with everything you you said, and I also think um, there's this whole removal of the intermediary as a general idea, right? Like so. So yeah, it deconstructs borders and makes everything more global and liquid immediately. But it also removes even you know intermediaries that are sitting within countries. So like for example, right now you got to go to a bank. Yeah. most people to get a loan. Well, DeFi basically removes the bank from that process. It really removes any intermediary if you structure that decentralized um, environment the, the right way. I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to getting those incentive mechanisms right and to getting these decentralized autonomous organizations set up properly. But, but you can see where it's going and it's very clear that that is the future. Sure. So like again i hate to go back to kind of the the stuff you read online but what's your opinion on on the security and the privacy around some of this stuff because obviously everybody hears that oh this bitcoin wallet got hacked again and a bunch of people lost a bunch yep. of money like can we demystify a little bit like how safe is actually investing in some of these digital assets and and classes so it's just like uh, a lot of other things, like, like like early users of the internet, right? Like right. there were, the internet itself necessarily wasn't the problem. It was insecure ways of using it, right. insecure passwords, insecure email behavior, clicking on links, you know, responding to African princes. What you're seeing is as people discover this new form of money, they 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 don't have any experience or training to understand the risk, and so we have to differentiate between real risks that are endemic to Bitcoin or any other digital asset, and then risks that are user error yeah, <laughs> um, or custodian risk or counterparty risk or any of these other traditional risks that exist in any other uh, system that are not unique or germane to Bitcoin. So I think, you know, in terms of risk at the Bitcoin level, if you, if you buy a Bitcoin today, there's the risk that someone uses quantum computing to completely crack the cryptography, right? Like that's, that's kind of like a, a super risk. Yeah. Then there are like risks below that relative to adoption, you know, relative to utility. Uh, there's, there are risks to some of the um, kind of second layer chains that are built on top like lightning. But the reality is like, in my view, the risk, some of those risks um, at the Bitcoin level are actually much lower than the risk of simply holding fiat currency. So if you put you know, $100,000 into USD today and, and you and you hold it for 20 years, the the risk that your money will have less purchasing power, I, I think it's guaranteed it'll have less purchasing power. Totally. With Bitcoin, there's actually a good possibility that it's worth significantly more relative to the current fiat unit of count, you know, in this country, which is USD. Um, in terms of user risk, right, it's like, look, if if you can't trust yourself to use email, you probably shouldn't try to hold on to your private keys, right? You, should, right? you probably shouldn't write them out on a piece of paper and put them in a, a drawer or a safe and you know, maybe your house burns down. You can use uh, any number of custodians, which I think are getting safer. It's, at some point within the next few years, it'll be just as safe to hold Bitcoin with certain you know, super secure custodians as it is to hold your Microsoft stock inside of Fidelity or Schwab. That's that's my view. It doesn't have to be correct, but my current view on the risk assessment is that it's going to be very very similar. Um, and so I think for most people, um, if they want to avoid that risk, use a third party custodian, put the asset into some sort of time release vault, right? Because these are bare assets. So if somebody gets access to the asset, if they get access to your keys, they own the asset, right? It's not right. like a stock certificate, which is harder to it's harder to steal. Right, but your your brokerage could go out of business in a very bad depression, um, and you've literally just loaned them those shares. You don't really own them unless you have the, the paper stock certificate. So, look, when you look deeper, there's risk in all of these models. I don't think the risks with Bitcoin in particular are much worse than the risk in in traditional um, assets, as long as you know what you're doing. No, I 100% agree, and I think there's a lot of people that use like summer 09 or some terrible password on some of their most private accounts online. Right. And 
they and then they wonder why they get hacked, right? So to your point, like it still fascinates me how little we care about security outside of or with our own kind of personal stuff, right? And so if if you're going to make the investment into anything or even using the internet as a user, I think you need to really care about making sure that you're the least likely to get hacked because at the end of the day, you, you like anybody can get hacked if they're not really that careful. But for the most part, if you do certain basic things, you're probably fine. And it sounds like you would say as long as you do some basic things, your digital assets should be fine. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, look, stick with, stick with a leading custodian. Don't try to maintain custody of your private keys unless you have some guidance or some technological sophistication. But honestly, for 90% of people, it's going to be just like the traditional financial market. It's safer to keep your money in the bank than under the mattress. <laughs> sure. No, hundred percent agree. So I want to get back into the data side of your business. Do you maybe want to give some examples of how your clients are actually leveraging your platform? Sure. Um, so one example, I, I kind of gave this alluded to before, but imagine you made an investment in a DeFi protocol, right? Okay. Like let's say you made an early investment in support of that team and support of that protocol. Um, but then, you know, three to six months later, your, your, your kind of view of what's going on uh, with, with that protocol has dated. And so one thing you'd want to do is you'd want to track every metric that matters to let you know that your investment, your, your original thesis is on track. So that could be things like adoption, right? Understanding who's adopting the protocol, what are they using it for, What's the concentration of that usage, right? So like, are you really seeing diverse distribution over time or are you seeing it concentrate in the hands of whales? Um, all those things should be relatively easy to do, but they're actually not, right? Because you would need to maybe run a node on Ethereum to pull down a lot of the data. You would need to tag a lot of the different wallets so you understand who those wallets likely are to be and what the user behavior is. You may need to tag a lot of the smart contact, contracts related to that protocol. It's a lot of work. It's, there's an infrastructure component like spinning up and running the nodes and building the data pipelines and pulling the data down. And so what you saw about a year or two ago was a lot of the top crypto hedge funds are actually trying to build their own infrastructure stack. And so even with two or three engineers and a data scientist, you're spending half a million or a million bucks a year to just run your own infrastructure. And that's before you even start asking the question, okay, now let's build those 50 metrics. Let's ask those 50 questions. Uh, that we want to actually know about that protocol. And so we basically provide that like plumbing layer, right? Gotcha. Where the, the moment you log in in the cloud to our platform, you can start by asking questions and actually going up the stack towards the higher level analytics. And you don't have to spend any time spinning up your cloud architecture with Amazon. You don't have to spend any time building feeds or, or ingesting, you know, building into web sockets or ingesting feeds or, you know, doing all of this cleansing or normalization of the data, right? And so that's a lot of the values. Like we're building a data utility that effectively will enable people to build anything they want on top of it faster. So DeFi is one thing. People want to monitor market events. They want to know like when Bitcoin plunges, which exchange is led. Well, in order to know that, you need to basically monitor, be monitoring price, volumes, order books across all of the exchanges. And there are hundreds. <laughs> We, we specifically monitor, say, 15 or 20 very, very closely. And so you can do a lead lag analysis very easily where you can see which exchange led on the initial dip, and then you can see which exchange or two led uh, coming back up. Um, and that type of information can be very valuable to funds that are trying to understand price behavior of these different assets. So those, I can't give too much more detail on that because some of the work our clients are doing is actually proprietary, right? And they actually, in our agreements, we actually have IP protection for them so that if they build stuff in our platform, they own that code. Gotcha. Um, and in some cases, they're, they actually have their own box. So they're they're writing and building things using our infrastructure that we can see that there's some resources being provisioned for those activities, but we don't actually know what it is they're doing. Interesting. So they can build their own. Wow, that's actually really interesting, right? Because 
Sure, to your point a few minutes ago, it would cost them a ton of money to build this internally and maintain it. And as new things update and change or become available, you guys just build it into the platform and they have access to leverage that. Yeah, that's that's actually really, really quite interesting. The This might be a stupid question, but I get asked this sometimes. And I just, I mean, I'm sure some of the listeners will have questions around this is where do you guys get the data? So, uh, I mean, we get it from hundreds of sources, yeah, right? Okay. But one of the things that makes crypto interesting for building the type of platform that we're, that we're building is that technically a lot of the core data you need to build something like this is public. Right. And so this is where the analogy to what we did at Brightscope is very relevant because while most of the data or all the data we were gathering initially at Brightscope was public, what was more important was how efficient uh, did you get at processing it? And then mm -hmm. what types of other data sets did you append to it to further illuminate that data and add additional value to the customer? And then how did you use that at value added data to lever in to getting higher quality data directly from your customers, which then creates a moat around the business. And so we're following a very similar playbook here, right? So yes, the raw WebSocket data coming from like a certain exchange is technically public, but you've got to do a lot of work to make it gapless, yeah. historical, to stream it into real-time applications, to make it accessible and easy to use via an API, to to plug it into other analytical environments, charting environments, you know, uh, uh, visualization software, right? And so it's not, it's it, the source of the data matters, and and certainly the fact that a lot of it is still free is a really interesting reason for us to try to build what we're building right now. We don't think that'll be the case forever, right? So we think the crypto data marketplace will look a lot like traditional financial markets within a decade, where every large venue is charging all of the users of that data, some sort of fee to, to leverage it, right? And so the window of, of time to build up, you know, some some advantages to, to build up a large platform like this and to do it at a cost effective way is limited, right? Because if we had to pay all the, the 50 or 100 exchanges that we're processing data from right now, something yeah. to use it, we would have already gone bankrupt because yeah. it's already so expensive. I mean, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars with Amazon sure. every month already. Um, sure. to run a heavy duty platform. We also had to pay for those data inputs. It would be completely uneconomical unless you could immediately sign several hundred customers right out of the gate. And there's just no way to have a big boom commercialization approach like that in a market as fragmented as global and as nascent as crypto, where frankly, the general sort of attitude and culture is to not pay for anything, right? People love yeah. to use free things on the internet. They, there's no, there, there's no like, um, you know, ability to know the quality of that data. And I don't think anyone's delusional in thinking that it's all, you know, valuable, but if you could get it for free um, in a small early space like this, a lot of people will try to do that. Um, and so, yeah, like, look, the, the on-chain data, you know, if you run a node on Bitcoin, it's pretty egalitarian. Anyone can do it. It's, it's not that easy to do it at scale. It's not that easy to do the sort of second order analytics that you want to do uh, on top of a network like Bitcoin. Um, yeah. But technically it's all, you know, you can get into the business very easily. And that's why a lot of people have, right? I would say it's probably been a hundred crypto analytics firms that we've seen over two years, probably 80% of those are already gone or pivoted out of the space. And of the 15 or 20 that remain, I'd say all of them are subscale and, and everyone's still trying to carve out kind of their niche. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think people don't realize how hard it is to get, like, you get free data, paid data, it doesn't matter. You you pull that in, you have to clean it, you have to let, allow it to play nice with other data sets, custom data sets, right. public data sets, even just my own company data set, right? And, and then to give it the actual um, charts or graphs or stats or or just the data that I want to get back from the app when you're pulling in, you know, potentially dozens of sources, right? Including my own internal data. It, it's actually right. like a huge nightmare that you guys are solving for, for a lot of companies. It's a heavy lift. And we, you know, we actually have 20 people. We, we got up to 25 wow. plus at the peak. Um, and so we're running like with 
almost double the headcount of most of the other crypto analytics firms. And that's because we didn't just build a lightweight GUI or just a set of APIs. We basically built a platform, again, that allows you to write code on it and build anything you want in a custom way and build custom dashboards and then, and then also suck down the data by API all in one place. And so that's a heavy lift. Now, the reason why our investors put nine and a half million dollars in the company uh, so far though, is that these types of businesses at scale have beautiful economics, right? They grow right. Yeah. 10, 20, 20 by 30% a year, even at scale, they usually have 30% net margins if they're really good businesses, right? And they're really, really hard to disrupt. They tend to run for decades, right? Growing right. for decades, they have to continue to invest in the business, but but even with all the CapEx investments, you still see 30% net margin. So they're cash flow machines, right? Yeah. Now, at the beginning though, just like a lot of other tech enabled businesses, they're very expensive to get started, right? So people think, oh, this is all in the cloud, it's software, it should be cheaper than a manufacturing business, and that's just not the case, right? Like yeah. engineering expertise is expensive, the cloud is expensive, uh, doing early biz dev and commercialization is expensive. Um, but if you survive, if you survive and you become one of the, say, two or three leaders in a space that has the potential to basically disrupt the entire capital markets infrastructure stack um, globally, yeah. right? Like yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a $100 billion plus opportunity, which is why, no surprise, a lot of the traditional billionaire capital markets guys ha have placed a lot of bets in this vertical. Sure. So how do you guys decide what new features to build into the platform because you're allowing your customers to basically build whatever they want on top of your platform? So there's obviously like even within that infinite uh, customization um, schema, there's still like a lot of things that people want off the shelf. Okay. Right. So there's there are a lot of models. There are a lot of analytics, there are a lot of charts, there are a lot of dashboards, a lot of views into the data that is that are pretty standard okay. that almost everybody wants. And so we try to improve the zero state of the platform constantly such that somebody who signs up today is going to have slightly more to work with than someone who signed up last quarter. Right. Um, and so there, there are like, there, there are features, there are like plat across platform features and across platform capabilities that we're always developing. And then there are also data sets that are just like once you nail those data sets, like certain derivatives data, for example, that are extremely complex to set up schematically, but once you have them flowing, they're very easy to plug in more, right? And to, to expand to the next derivatives data set. And so look, like there's a lot of custom work being done at the user level, but the platform capabilities and the data sets that are accessible by the platform are growing every day. And we prioritize by basically looking at our top clients. So we're right. still a relatively small organization. We we specifically went towards enterprises and large customers. And so we don't have 100 or 200 people to listen to. We have like 25. Gotcha. Right? And of those 25, there are five or 10 that would be considered very large size organizations. And then there are 10 or 15 that are sort of medium or small. Um, and so we just prioritize by, you know, contract size, by influence, and then to some degree by the intellectual heft of those organizations. We try to work with organizations that are leaders. And so for the most part, when an organization says, this is very important to us, they're usually a few quarters ahead of the rest of the industry. Okay. So we've literally had customers point us at stuff that we weren't that aware of, that we hadn't heard too many people talk about. We go build it and lo and behold, six months later, everybody in the space is talking about. And that's very important because in a space like crypto, if you build for what you think the market wants today, you will be whipsawed constantly. Because we've already seen over the last two years, what people told us they wanted in Q2 of 2018 is hardly even relevant today. The space has moved that far. The narrative has moved. The things people are investing in, the things people are focused on. And so it's very important to have some high signal feedback and prioritization uh, capabilities that you're getting. Um, and one way to do that is to sign those big customers really early, uh, get them using your platform, get their feedback, make sure they're getting value from it, and they will lead you to where, you know, the next big opportunities are. Interesting. No, uh, yeah, no, that's that's quite fascinating. I, I'm curious then, obviously you guys have signed some of these big, what quote unquote kind of big whale type clients. Do you have any advice for startups looking to sign some of these big companies, whether it's in the the financial space or not? 
so it's funny, like uh, when I look back uh, to Brightscope, you know, we founded that in 2008. Right. Uh, we were out in the market in 2009. We didn't really start selling our enterprise product until 2010. And I remember there was a transition where I went from thinking like number of views of our website, because it had gone from zero to 80 or 100,000 a month, which at the time was considered to be a lot for a niche sure. uh, website, right? Still in is, unique in a lot of cases. <laughs> and there were like a million page views. And I would track metrics like that because that was cool at the time. That was the internet. And that was how you knew that like people were getting value. But that was for an ad supported model. It was actually one of our advisors who ended up becoming now the CEO of a Fortune 500 insurance company at the time was the CEO of a retirement business for one of the biggest broker dealers in the United States and then went on to be the CEO of one of the largest asset managers in Asia. And what we realized is that these folks that are very senior executives that are clients that are in transition, they usually have like a three to six month gap between roles. And during that time, they're still very uber connected to their colleagues at other firms, right? But but they're not at any firm and they're not right. politically tied to any firm. And so they're able to make intros and they're able to to, to get you meetings. So we literally had one of those advisors fly into New York and Chicago wow. a couple of times and walk us in to three or four, you know, CEO executive committee level executives where we had a one-on-one -on -one demo in their office. We put it up on screen. We showed them how the data worked. We showed wow. them how they could use it. And our advisor who just was a well-respected executive from a, another firm would, would chime in and say, yeah, this is how we would have used this at JP Morgan, or this is how we would have uh -huh. used this at Fidelity, or this is how we were using it. And so then it gives that, buyer at that other firm confidence, right, that that they could utilize it as well. And and that we have that credibility with that audience. And so don't underestimate, you know, pulling that kind of senior executive advisor card. And don't underestimate just getting on an airplane and showing up for a meeting. I, I used to think that was grunt work and hard work. It didn't make sense. And it'd be better just to build a platform, a software platform that does all the work for you. But I've recognized now that if you want $500,000 a year clients with names like JP Morgan and Fidelity, you actually need to get on an airplane. You actually need to show up in the meeting. You need to shake hands, even though no one's doing that anymore with COVID, but you have to shake their hand. You have to look them in the eye. You have to tell them your story. You have to give them confidence that if they sign up with you, you won't make them look stupid sure. and that you'll make them look smart to their boss and you'll help them get real ROI from the platform. And I think that's really hard to do as a startup if you don't show up. No, that's actually really good advice. Follow up to that, any tips on getting a good advisor or getting your stuff in front of people that are senior enough to be advisors to other people? Yeah, I get quoted in the Wall Street Journal a lot, <laughs> sure. right? Like, like uh, be credible, um, be visible, show up at the conferences, speak on the panels, do the CNB, CNBC appearances, right? We did a lot of that. We did one or two CNBC or Fox Business every year. I did NPR every other year. Would do. Uh, we were quoted several hundred times a year in the mainstream press, and we really focused on being well known by the industry press, right? So, okay. in traditional financial services, that would be uh, publications like 401k Wire and Mutual Fund Wires and Ignite and RAA Biz. Nobody outside of our vertical knew those publications, but everybody inside of our vertical read them. Uh, and so, if they see your picture and they see your quote. Repeatedly, at some point, they're sitting in a room, they're on a Saturday, maybe they're at home in their home study, and they're like, these guys are showing up everywhere. Yeah. I need to like, like at least get in front of them and understand why. And sure. invariably, they get they set up a meeting, five or 10 senior execs from their organization, and after a demo and a, a short conversation, they would be interested. Those advisors, um, the best advisors that we, we signed, I either met in person because they saw a presentation we gave at like a fintech conference or a financial uh -huh. services conference. Or, or they were a customer or a potential customer in between jobs. So they, they use our platform at one place. They made a career switch. They ended up bringing it into their next place, no surprise. Um, and they also became fearless about introducing us to other customers because we made them look good multiple times previously. Sure. No, that makes sense. And, and it sounds like at the end of the day, you're just creating content, whether it's at, like you start pushing it online, you're talking at conferences, you're showing up at these places. It like, and it doesn't happen overnight. It obviously, it probably took you guys weeks or months to get in front of some of these people. You can't just put out one piece of content and expect a hundred responses. You might not get none. I've, I've kind of heard, and I'm curious, it's almost like you need sometimes like 
100, 200 pieces of content before you start really getting noticed. Do you, do you agree with that? Yes. I, I, so here, here's, let me tell you what's changed. So when we started at Brightscope, we were 25 and 27 years old. We didn't know anyone in our vertical. We didn't even know necessarily what we were building or who our customer was. Okay. And so it took, it took five years really from 2008 to sort of 2009, like 2009, 10 is when we launched and when we started to get press. It wasn't until like 2012, 2013, where we were recognized broadly in the industry as sort of like the de facto standard and so credible that if we asked for a meeting with you, you would take it. Right. And that, that so five years of fidelity, right. Yeah. To, to become known well enough that we could get a meeting when we asked for it. Now what's, what's changed is crypto is so like, again, the narrative is moving so fast. The, the industry's changing so fast, like half the firms that were around two years ago are not, around right. and there's a whole new crop of firms that weren't even around six months ago and so because it's it's so volatile and it's so fast moving and so innovative there's much more openness about listening and talking to having initial meetings with firms that they've never heard of before and people they've never met Interesting. and so we've we've benefited a lot from our previous experience and our previous credibility but we also recognize very quickly that we did not need to do the same level of pr and marketing because we made a few calls through our networks and we were able to get to, you know, somebody at every firm. Like if we made a list in 2018, early 2018 of the top 50 firms we wanted to talk to, we talked to 48 of them wow. and the two we didn't talk to went out of business or closed up shop. Gotcha. So, so like the marketing we thought we needed to do 10 years ago in crypto just wasn't necessary. And I think this is a really important part of being a CEO, right. In a, in a modern, in a very innovative new space like this is to recognize the differences between the approaches that worked a decade ago or even just three years ago and what will work now and making sure you're not sort of reflexively doing the same set of things right. that you've seen work before without recognizing what is different. Right. And so like a lot of people say, how come your website doesn't look like an enterprise SaaS marketing website? And because the answer is we, we actually determined very early on that we didn't need to do that in order to get at bats with potential right. customers and, and spending any time or money on that going back to what we talked about earlier, it would have been a bad focus and it would have been a waste of time and money to do that at the time. I'm not saying we won't ever do it or that it isn't something that you eventually check the box. Right. It just wasn't mission critical to sign customers, build product or raise or hire new people. Um, and if we had spent time on that, even if it was a week, it would have been time not spent, increasing our lead, you know, in the real market where customers are actually won and lost. Nobody was looking at our website to make that decision. They were looking at our real live demo of the platform and then using it under trials and then making the decision from there. Interesting. No, I, I think that's, that's really good advice, but sadly we're out of time. So how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about uh, digital assets data and any other links you want to mention? So the best, best way to, to, uh, to kind of interact with me is on Twitter now. I hated Twitter <laughs> five or seven years ago. I didn't understand it. The crypto industry has opened my eyes to the value and how you can get, you can kind of tune your feed to get sure. information that you're not getting anywhere else. You can get it early. Like, for example, everybody in crypto knew that something was going on with COVID and the virus well before the mainstream market, right? right. Doesn't mean they get everything right, but um, there's a lot of things that have been early there. So I, I really like Twitter as a medium, you know, at Mike Alfred at Twitter is my handle. We have a website, digitalassetsdata.com. Again, the, the only reason why that site is even there is if somebody wants to look us up, they can, you know, request a demo of the, of the platform. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day, man. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate Thank it. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future. <laughs>